black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. <laughs> Five, five, four, four, three, three, two, one, one. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Episode 500, and that was my old intro you heard there. I did a little mix up there and uh, played my old intro. Hope you enjoyed it. I know some of the new listeners are probably wondering what's going on. People who've been listening to the show for a long time know that's my uh, old intro. I thought for episode 500, I'd bring it back. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Paul McDonald from Canada. Uh, He's one of my listeners and it's his birthday. Happy birthday, Paul. And I also have Tony Merkel here from the Confessionals Podcast. Go to theconfessionalspodcast.com. If you listen on your iPhone or your Android, you can go to iTunes or Stitcher and download the Confessionals. Tony, thanks for coming on for episode 500, man. Thanks for having me on, man. It's, uh, It's an honor to be here, for real. The honor's mine. It's uh, it's crazy hitting 500. I know you you listened to the uh, Les Stroud interview before anyone else did. Can't even talk tonight. <laughs> um, and I was curious, what did you think? Oh man, listen, I really enjoyed this episode. It, it took a turn that I didn't expect. Let's just put it that way. I, I expected we were just gonna you know hear your traditional Bigfoot ideas and different things like that, and just keep it within the quote-unquote box but uh less took it in different directions and i think caught you by surprise too but it turned out to be a phenomenal interview and i'm really excited for people to hear this yeah i appreciate saying that yeah it did take a turn but um i'm glad less opened up and he shared a lot of times people don't they don't open up with everything and he was really forthright with with what happened to him and, uh, you know, Les kind of surprised me. He's um, he's actually a really super nice guy. He's super humble, really down to earth. I know he'll be listening to the show. I'll tell you the one thing that really surprised me about Les uh, was his sense of humor. I, I kind of pictured him being kind of a serious guy, and he's got a gr- fantastic sense of humor. He's hilarious. And uh, I really appreciate Les coming on for episode 500. This is a milestone. It really is. Uh, I mean, 500 episodes, that's a... That's a lot of work. That's a lot of man hours that you put into the show and stuff for a very long time. I mean, I'm at episode 104 next week and I'm like, man, that's two years of work, you know, (laughs) and you've been doing this for 500 episodes. Kudos to you, man. You've been doing this for a long time. 
Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's um, like you and I were just talking before we went on the air. You know, when you do a show like this, you kind of you tend to live in a bubble and you just kind of live in this little bubble. You're constantly worrying about the next show like some freak. And rarely do you ever stop to kind of look back at what you've done. And, you know, this week I've kind of stopped. I haven't really done much online. Just kind of look back at everything, how the show's come along, how it's progressed how the quality of the show's gone up, you know, the audio quality, the quality of guests. And uh, it's been a hell of a ride. I'm really proud of the show, and I'm happy to have you here. Yeah, let me ask you a question. I mean, with everything that you've done with the show, I mean, you've done, you started the memberships, and you started just basically everything from ground up. I mean, there had to be a lot of, like, learning curves and uh, trials and failures and stuff. Like, what are some of the things that you that kind of stick out in your head as to, that you picked up along the way that you feel either benefited you as a person or you grew from uh, individually as the show went on? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I could say. I, I think the biggest thing, you know, when I first got into this, you and I have talked many times off the air, and I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to do a podcast. I didn't know how a podcast should sound. Um, I always hated the audio. I mean, pretty much any episode under 300, I hate the audio. Uh, it sounds terrible. And I've always wanted to improve that, always wanted to improve that. And still, To this day, I'm still not happy with the audio. But I think learning how to deal with people, learning how to listen. Um, because, you know, when you do a podcast like this, I know a lot of people listen and they think, oh, that sounds easy. Wes just sits there and doesn't really say much and just lets the person tell the story well that's the whole point is to have the the eyewitness be the star of the every show and to learn to keep your mouth shut when someone's talking because there's so many times where i i intentionally mute myself out and i want to jump in i want to go well wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute but i think you learn over time it ruins the flow of the show if i were to jump in every time i want to jump in i listen to a lot of podcasts where they do that I think it ruins the flow of the show. So I think learning the flow of the show, there's a lot of um, different things that I've learned that's hard to like articulate. Like just learning the flow of a show, learning to keep a show going, keep it moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. Don't get too tied up on one certain thing or don't go off in too many different tangents. And learning just how to deal with people. You know, there's a lot of times where I talk to people off the air and they're, they're in tears. Um, they're in bad shape, you know, and learning just how to deal with people and how to talk to people. I, I really think that's the heart of podcasting is is learning how to talk to people. You're absolutely right. And that's something that I noticed from your show very early on before we ever started talking. I mean, I came onto the show probably around episode 50 or 60 around that time. And listening to your show, one of the things as a listener before you and I ever talked, this is years before you and I ever talked, listening to your show I really felt like you let the person tell their story in completion. And that's something that you don't get with TV. That's something you don't get with radio shows on FM radio and a lot of podcasts where it's getting cut off. It's cut into pieces and you don't really feel like as a listener, you got the whole story and the motion behind it. And you were kind of setting the ground breaking things there when it came to this podcast thing where you let people come on and just share your story, you know, and to be honest with you, that's how I learned how to do it myself and stuff. I mean, when you, I'll tell people a story about you, Wes, if you don't mind, but like when you, uh, you know, we're starting this podcast and I'm listening to your show and everything, never thought I'd ever talk to you. You know, it's not something that was on my agenda. And this is a kind of a testament to who you are as a person, you know, like everybody listens to you on a weekly basis and they, they think they know who you are because they, they get, they feel like they get to know you after 500 episodes. I mean, they, they, they feel like they're part of your inner circle almost. And so you, you have these ideas of who Wes is as a person and stuff. And I'll tell you, like, I, after getting to know you for the last two years on a very personal level, I mean, we're really good friends. Uh, you are who you say you are period and a story. Uh, and to tell the people that a little story here, uh, you and I never talked before. And one day I get a text from you over Facebook messenger. And, uh, you, you asked me if I was ever on the show and I told you no, because I never had a Bigfoot encounter. And then I hadn't heard back from you for like two weeks. And I was thinking, okay, whatever, you know, no big deal. And one day I'm a truck driver and I back my truck into the dock at work one day. And all of a sudden I get a video phone call from you over Facebook. 
And you and I sat there, I'm in my truck at work, and we talked for like 45 minutes and you were just reaching out to say hi. And it was just like being nice and, and kind. And during our conversation and stuff, you knew that I had the YouTube channel and things like that. And you encouraged me to start my own podcast. And, you know, you didn't know that I had experience with audio production, and things like that before. But uh, you were the biggest motivating factor for the confessionals to really get off the ground and get going with a podcast form because uh, I, I really didn't even think about it a whole lot before you encouraged me to do that. And that was something that we're complete strangers. I mean, I think that was in our first conversation. We never talked to each other before. And here you are, somebody you, do, you don't know. You don't know if I'm a jerk or not. And you're just encouraging me to do something that... You know, and you know this for a fact. When I first started the show, you had people emailing me, e- emailing you saying, why are you helping somebody to compete against you? You know, so like that's how people typically think about it. But that's not the way you think about it. And, you know, you just encouraged me. And we started the podcast and, you know, my show's going great now and everything like that. But, you know, it really wouldn't have gotten off the ground if you didn't help me birth that idea of starting my own podcast. And so I want to say thank you to you. And for the listeners out there and stuff, that's the kind of person you are. You know, you're just a kind guy, and I really appreciate your friendship. Uh, I appreciate that, man. It's turning into a. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I appreciate you saying that, though, man. And and I just believed in you. I thought you do a great job as a as. Uh, and that's a funny thing. A lot of these other Bigfoot podcasts are they're all in competition. They all gotta. Why? What? What's the point? If you listen, people that listen to Sasquatch Chronicles listen to the confessionals. You know what I mean? They just do. And yeah. they, they I'm sure they listen to other podcasts too as well. I just thought you had a lot of talent and I thought that you had a great voice, great presentation. And I, I just thought you'd do great at it. I really did. I, I really I wasn't looking for for anything from you. I wasn't looking to um you know, I just thought you do a great job at it. And you have. I mean I there's a lot of times where I listen to the confessionals and I pick up on the little things that you do, you know, your transitions, how you, and I'm like, God, I want to steal that. I want to steal how he does that. I want to, um, and that's a testament to your, your show and what you do, man. And you should be proud of what you do. And I appreciate you saying that, you know, it's funny that a lot of times people think that they know you and I, I, you know, sometimes I wear with my heart on my sleeve and sometimes I'll do shows and I'll get emails from people and they'll be like, you okay? You seem kind of down. You, you seem kind of, and I'm like, really? You could tell that through the podcast? Like, I don't, I really, you could tell. And so I, I just have a hard time being fake on the show. You know, if I'm, if I'm down, I'm down. If I'm up, I'm up. You know what I mean? I, I just have a hard time putting on a persona. Plus, I don't think personas, listen, the audience too, is too smart to figure yes. out. They're way too smart. They, they know when you're full of it and they know when you're putting it on and when you're not. So why not just be yourself? You know what I mean? Sometimes I'm down when I do the show. There's not much I can do about it. Sometimes I'm up and I just try and produce a quality show. And it means so much to me when people email me and say, hey, man, you know, I'm in the hospital or my my father just passed away or uh, this time of year around the holidays. Uh, I struggle because, uh, you know, my family or this and that. And I listen to your show. It's a getaway. I, I get to forget about everything for an hour and just listen. And that means a lot, man, that, that it means that much to people. Uh, that means more to me than anything else. Uh, the fact that it, it I, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, that it means so much to people. Because like I said, you do live in a bubble. You just go from show to show to show to show. And that's why I laugh sometimes because the listeners will be like, hey, you remember on episode 328 when you said blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what show was that? Did I have that guy on? What what, what was that encounter about? And it's like the, the audience knows the show so well. But you do get a relationship with your audience. You do have this relationship with your audience. And that's something I've always appreciated very much. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it any That's better. why I'm doing 500 with everyone, man. I, I've been getting emails all day long. Are you going to be, is it just going to be a member only show? No, I'm celebrating with everyone, man. Everyone's listening. Uh, I want you guys to enjoy this moment as much as I'm enjoying this moment. And uh, members, non-members, I want everyone to enjoy this moment. I, I want it. It's a milestone, not just for me, but for everyone who's been with me from the beginning and has seen the progression. And I'd be a real douchebag if I was like, well, it's going to be members only 500. You got to sign up. Blah, blah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just don't have it in me to do that. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I just want to say, you know, and I'm sure I speak for the rest of the audience and stuff. 
Uh, thank you for putting on the show because the show, even if you don't want to say it's you, uh, the show definitely inspires so many people, whether it's just to look into the topic or uh, the, the imagination that it sparks in people's minds of thinking about what is possible and what if this is real and all that stuff. I mean, this show really has uh, placed a stamp on the quote unquote Bigfoot culture. And from me and the audience to you, just want to say thank you, man. Thank you, brother. Well, let's jump into it. Let's start this uh, interview with Les Stroud. Take a listen. Well, I want to welcome uh, Les Stroud to the show, Survivor Man himself. We are down here in Oregon. Les, thanks for coming on, man. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, you're very gracious to uh, invite me to your home. And uh, I just want to thank you for that. Uh, that no, that's called laziness. Because <laughs> it was either this or, or I have to go somewhere. And this yeah. you, you had to come somewhere. No, and, that's great. I, I wanted to ask you, if, I wanted to start out. I know we're going to be t- talking about uh, Bigfoot, but I kind of want to talk about you and, and your show. What, what in God's name was going through your mind when you decided to go out and survive and film it? I mean – it's hard enough to go out and survive, but let alone film it and have it be something really cool. How did you get started with that? Well, as you can imagine, it's not a matter of waking up with the the light bulb above the head one day and going, oh, I should create this series doing this uh, this whole survival thing. There you go. Sorry. How's this? Uh, Do I sound better? Perfect. It's sexier? You can adjust that if you want. Well, I'll move it. I'm, yeah, I, don't know, I don't know how to work with microphones. Yeah, but, right. Yeah. <laughs> there. There. Is this nice and sexy if I Perfect. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, and that was something I had to learn along the way was film production and audio and all the rest. But uh, it, I, I, it, it re- the answer is really within what happens to all of us in terms of just life. And that is, I believe, that... that uh, Things just fall in on, on, on like all the skill sets that we get, all the things we do, it all starts to fall in on, on us. And, and at some point you're left there with a, an amalgam, like a, a collection of what you can do with all these, this, these skills you put in your toolkit, so to speak. So for me, it's, I mean, it starts from childhood, loving, loving nature um, and uh, just starting with, a, with the joy of watching uh, Jacques Cousteau and, and uh, Tarzan movies and then – Fast forward to mid twenties and becoming an outdoor adventurer and a guide, and then eventually taking survival training, and then becoming a train a survival guide and instructor, and fifteen years of that long before Survivor Man. But along the way, see, my life's always been on two tracks. One has been in, in um, wilderness adventure, and the other one's been in music. Hmm. So along the way, they they battled each other. They've won for the the center stage, or they've worked together. And when music was winning, that's when I learned editing and filmmaking because I was working on rock videos. And so when Adventure won, somewhere along the lines, I thought, huh, this is really cool stuff, what I'm doing. I should film this. Like, I could, I could do that. I could film this, you know? Yeah. And so uh, one thing led to another, and I started filming my adventures until I realized that the survival component of what I did, did as an outdoor adventurer – was pretty unique. Nothing like it was on TV. No. There was one guy, Bush Tucker Man, had a really interesting show that I, that I liked, but it, he wasn't surviving. Survivor Series with, uh, uh, on the CBS uh, network began, but that wasn't survival. That was, a, that was Outward Bound meets a game show. Um, and so nobody was doing – and so what did I want to do? I wanted to teach skills. That's all I really wanted to do. I mean, in the 80s, I thought I would be doing this and making home videos – to teach how to do the fireball. But when it finally all happened, no, the opportunity to make it a a television series. And I want to talk about that more. One question I've always wanted to ask you, have you ever been in a position where you think, I'm in real trouble here? Hang on. Do you want me to get my dog to be quiet? Is he, is he like, is he like freaking you out? All? Oh, he's no. fine. It's oh, cool. No, he's fine. So for, for the listening audience, if you hear weird sounds in the background, I have a chocolate lab puppy who is playing around <laughs> our feet there. That explains it. There you and go. that's all you have to do. Yep. It's like in there filmmaking, you, you can't watch somebody and hear running water. If you don't at least get a glimpse of the running water, because it freaks your mind and eye out. You're like, I don't, un- why does it sound like I can't cut right. to, rushing streams 17 feet away. Oh, I get it now. And now it's all acceptable. So there you go. Now your audience knows there's a dog playing around our feet. <laughs> explained. It's a good, Phenomenon good dog explained. It wasn't Bigfoot after all. <laughs> Sorry. What was the question? Uh, now? My, my question is, have you ever been in a position where you, you thought, I'm in, I'm in real trouble here? 
if I don't get out of here, I'm in. I'm. This isn't going to end well. Well, I mean, non Survivor man, uh, yeah, uh, chased up a tree by a bull moose in the rutting season up in oh, uh, Canada. Um, if you Google. Les Stroud, my favorite story. That's still on. That's still online. You can listen to that story. Um, then, uh, but on Survivor Man, uh, two occasions, and it's not the sensational stuff. It never is. You know, it's not. I got chased by a jaguar. Okay, that was. I got treated by a tiger. Okay, those sound. You know, pretty like whoa. But really, it was um, heat stroke in the Kalahari Desert on that episode. Uh, that was very very dangerous. And um, and then uh, hypothermia, the other end of the scale, in uh, in Norway, going down the mountain slopes. I mean, there's things that I said, you know, that I asked my editor, don't don't put that in the show because I was I was at a desperate state. I was quite worried for my own, you know, safety at the time. Yeah, that's um, yeah. I would imagine that. You know, I, I've always wondered that up because you go out there, and the one thing I like about, and we can talk about some of the you know the copycats that came along, but. You don't – when you watch Survivor Man, what I like about it is you look like you've been to hell and back by the time the episode's over with. There's a physical drain on you. You see that and you – and any I think anyone with half a brain can go, this guy was really out there with cameras because he's lost weight. He looks like he's been to hell and back. And some of these others – and I know they're, they're cop, trying to copy what you do and put their own spin on it. But a lot of these guys climb out of these – structures or whatever they set up for the night and they look like they just came back from the Hyatt Hotel. That's because they did. (laughs) And, you know, like the makeup, someone just did some makeup. Mm. I'm like, I know you didn't sleep in that structure. You would look like hell coming out of that street. And that's what a thing I always appreciate about yours is maybe I'm not saying it the right way, but you look like hell by the time the episode's over with. You know this guy's gone to hell and back. Mm. You know, we were talking earlier off off microphone about Joe Rogan. That's the first thing he said to me because I look at your eyes like that, that you can't, you can't make up that, you yeah. know, and um, yeah, I didn't actually have to do anything in, in that, per, that respect, because uh, I, I think what people might miss is like, well, how much do you sleep? Well, you know what? You don't, you don't really, in a survival situation, you don't sleep. You get, if you get 20 minutes, okay, then you're awake for an hour or two. And maybe you might get another 20, but you're cold, you're on a rock, you're being bugged out. Um, and that definitely shows, I mean, that only takes 24 hours to show up on, on my face. And yeah, it, it would be funny to watch the, all of the shows that have come along. And, I, you know, I, we're going there a little bit now, but, I, you know, I, I get some people, oh, that's not very nice of you to say. And it's, you know, it feels like, They're copycats. Uh, well, yeah. And, 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 but the reality is, guys. And it's a piss poor copy. Well, exactly. When Survivor Man began, when I did everything, that was me doing what you see me doing. And everything else has been acting. And and uh, again, I have to disclaimer here it, it, or, uh, is that or qualifier is that for those people who are actually who are on alone and naked and afraid, they are really hurting. I would not take away from their suffering, but they're not doing anything that's really wilderness survival. They're doing what the producer said he needs them to do now. Right. You know, now we need you over here and one and, and we're you know, we need you bickering. So what you saw me happening to me was just uh, I didn't feel it was uh boring. I felt it was a true representation of someone becoming bedraggled. Yeah. You know? It makes the show real. It really makes the show real, and it makes you – that's what I love about the show. I, w- I wonder, when you first started this, what it, how was it received by TV producers? Were they like, no one's ever going to watch this? That's You're- exactly what they said. That's exa- In fact, I first played it for two TV producer friends of mine, and they kind of actually laughed me you know, out of the room. And, and, I, and I respected them, and I worked with them a lot. And I remember afterwards feeling hurt. I remember thinking, huh. And then, of course, classic me, I thought – Okay. Okay. I'll show you, you know, and, um, yeah, two weeks later I had, uh, I had the show signed and a year later they were both asking me for a job. Oh, really? So, so yeah, it, but the, see, things have changed. So, oh, is that a frog now? We have dogs <laughs> and frogs. At least it's fitting. It's ambience. It? It's ambience, yeah. man. Uh, that I'm is surviving my, with Survivor Man. That's Not my really. resident frog. I had literally <laughs> pulled that frog out of the living room last night and put him back there. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Um, when I, when I, the thing about the industry is this. it's easy to say words like the industry, the networks, you know, but in the end, it still always comes down to one person. 
There's yeah. somebody there sitting in the in the gatekeeper's chair going, yeah, I don't like it. Yeah. You know, or, ooh, we got something here. Or, and then, it, sorry, I'm going to uh, uh, tangent a little, because then it depends on what type of person they are in sitting in that chair. Are they a risk taker? Are they a bean counter? Or are they a hybrid in between? And the risk takers and the hybrids in between, that's who I love. That's yeah. who I get along with. The bean counters I have no time for. So the bean counters, mm, no, we don't, we've, never, we've never seen anything like this before. So no, we don't have any numbers on this. So we can't prove it out. No. The risk taker goes, I like it. I like it. I've never seen anything like this. Right. This is really cool. You know, you see the difference. They're saying the same sentence, but, but the risk. And so I had a risk taker named Anna uh, Stambolic. Actually, I had the first one um, uh, was uh, Jane Menge in Canada at Discovery. And, and I, I literally phoned her up, said the survi- I told her the Survivor Man idea, and she said, you know, we were thinking of something just like this, and we didn't know who to call. So she mm. took the risk on me, and then... It hit so well as a kind of a – think of it like a news piece that we were doing that then when I wanted to sell it as a series, the next risk taker said, what do you mean What do you mean they passed on you? You're kidding me? You mean you're available? Yes, I want Survivor Man. Of course. I, yeah. All right. Come, come, how quickly can you come down here and sign a contract? And the rest is history. It's cool because there's nothing else on TV at the time when you started. You know, I know we talked about copycats, but when you started, there was not. It the show had this a real feel to it. Had a it was cool. It's like you you get to go along the adventure, except for I get to eat at night and lay in bed. You know. And, yeah. But it yeah. was cool. I get to go along with the adventure with you. And I'd never yeah. seen anything like that on TV before. That's you know? that's what everybody would say too. They'd say, you know, I'm. I was in the hotel room, you know, because a lot of rock stars like Survivor Man, and I was cruising the dial there, and your show pops up, but that doesn't look like anything else that's on TV, and I couldn't turn away. Yeah. And that grabbed a lot of people as we went along, and, and uh, I was, and and I'm going to say, I'm going to put this out there, and and uh, because I feel maybe it's braggadocio, maybe it's not, maybe it's just pride, but I can point legitimately to several. Camera maneuvers and editing techniques that did not exist before Survivor Man. Now, am I a genius filmmaker? No, it was necessity. I was alone, so the only way I can capture X was to do this. And then come along these other ones with crews and everything, and you look at them trying to pretend to be alone and fake it, and like you'll see Bear Grylls holding the cameraman's lens as he walks, it. really yeah. trying to pretend like he's holding the camera as he walks, it. but which I did out of necessity. So I have a uh, some pride in myself and my editor um, Barry Farrell in the fact that because of necessity, we did certain things that nobody else had ever done, and now they're all over the place. Yeah, you know. Even you mentioned Naked and Afraid. They mm-hmm. steal the way you shoot things. Yeah, the and whole alone, show shoots. Yeah. Every, they steal everything. Oh, exactly. And and so and I like you, Naked and Afraid too. By the way, yeah. So you got to give it up and let it go. You know. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I, I is it braggadocio or is it pride? Uh, is it humble pride? I don't know what you want to call it, but I am proud of. The, of what we did. And I can tell you, there were lots of occasions where I'd be sitting there going, well, no one else has ever done this. I'm going to do it. And that, you know, and the other occasions is like, this is the only way I can make, th- I can show this. I'm going to have to do this. And then I, so let me g- give you an example, a little behind the scenes vision for, for people who don't know the film industry that well, um, TV industry back in the day. Uh, and this was the, you know, right place, right time for so many things, right? Mm. You doing this podcast, you know, right mm. place, right time. Well, back in the day, to be able to film myself, we are talking about shoulder-mounted cameras that weigh a lot of poundage uh, called Sony beta cams. You know, you can't film yourself with that, but that's what existed when I started. Mm. And then all of a sudden, yeah, there was no small cameras, no mm. GoPros, no nothing, and so I could not have done Survivor Man even five years before the day that I did. But what changed all that? A piece of gear called the Sony VX1000, little handheld camera. And it was just under the wire for being quality enough that the networks would allow it to be broadcast quality. Mm-hmm. You see, you could have the little high eights, but they were not broadcast quality. You needed the Sony beta cam, the big cameras. So you couldn't film yourself. Along comes the Sony VX1000. Okay. It still wasn't quite there, but here's, and here's the, the cool behind the scenes part. 
So what they they said was, well, you're allowed to use 10% that footage and 90% has to be this mm. such and such. Okay. Now, and bear with me on this story because this is how all – this is how things come together brilliantly, you know. Well, uh, but at the same time was emerging Final Cut Pro, a new editing thing. You know, this is before Adobe Premiere and uh, these little editing things that – I could do it home and it cost two grand. And Avid, Avid's cost $300,000 to edit in a big pro- – so now no. you got a little camera. You got a little editing suite. You got me going out there shooting by myself and, I can, and I'm starting to use these little cameras. So what I did was I would edit together my show. I'd send it in. I would lie. I would just tell them, yeah, no, it's 90% big camera. <laughs> and I would color correct it and clean it all up and fix it up. It looked beautiful. And they didn't notice – and here's the kicker. One day they noticed, and this is literally like season two, I think. Lots of shows go on. It's a hit. And some, some QC bean counter noticed. some some <laughs> QC quality oh. control, the other dark side. Yeah. Noticed and said, This show's unacceptable. So I called up the executive producer. I said, So don't take my show. And it was a hit. And he's just like yeah, don't worry about this list. We'll, we'll look after quality control. <laughs> so there I am shooting with what was supposed to be substandard cameras. So what's the difference? Content. Yeah. Content. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah. I wasn't filming in big, huge cameras with the high def, this and that. And this was back in the standard def days. I was shooting on these smaller cameras, and but the content. The content yeah. was killer. It so was. that was a long story, but there you go. No, no, I'm glad you told it. And, and you're right. It is. It comes down to content. I think you could have shot it with the GoPro, and I would have still watched it. I mean, well, because it's about content, exactly. isn't it? And I would, you know, there, there's a few, you know, allowances I make. Like, I agree, good audio is everything. And I would try to talk with young guys trying to do this. And I say, you got to understand something. If you're going to spend some money, put it into audio. You need a proper lav. You need to, I need to hear your voice rich and clear. And now it's, it's changing, a lot of shotgun mic stuff, but there's still no substitute when you hear this, you know, in yeah. the camera. Right. And I'm going, all right. This has been literally three and a half days. I've got nothing in my stomach. And I know that's going to make me sick, but I don't really have much. Tr- when you hear me talking like that, I bring you into the moment. Yeah, absolutely. But if, but if I'm talking like this, it's been three and a half days and I, you know, because right. the microphone's terrible. And then you don't have, you don't have that. You're it's not, all presentation. Yeah. So to yeah. me, that was something technically I thought, no, audio is important. But other than that, it's content, content, content. Yeah. No, and we'll get to uh, Bigfoot. I'm just fascinated by the whole Survivor, man. I've always had like a million questions. Do, do you ever get to the point where you're just tired of it? You're like, oh, God, you know, they're going to send me out here. And um, Did you ever do a podcast where Bullfrog was chirping in the background? I love it. I think it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me I content know where, presentation. Let me know where I, let me go. Where, I know where you're what you're asking. Um, the short answer is every single time, every single time on the day, on the third day, fourth day, I would quit in my mind. I would quit, and I would think, what am I doing out here? This sucks. I'm cold. I'm hungry. I'm sleeping on a rock. It's buggy. You know, who cares? Who cares what I'm doing out here with this? And uh, and and worse than that, if I would have a what we call a, a B-roll team, a beauty uh, footage team of camera people that would go off and film the birds and the bees and the time lapses, right. right? And I know they would be like maybe 50 miles away, maybe five miles away, but they'd be somewhere having a meal. And that would even make me lonelier. So every, every show I, I, I'd had enough. But the motivation came in the form, and I know this is going to sound a little cliche. It's like the, like, it's like the Babe Ruth kind of thing. Like, I'm going to hit a home run for you, kiddo. But I would literally think, you know what? Some kid somewhere, 12 year old, you know, is going to be watching this show eventually and they're going to be hanging off every word I'm saying right now while I do this fireball. So, Stroud, bring it. Bring your A game. Don't phone it in. And I never did. No, it's like your whole harmonica. It's brilliant. Mm. Get your mind off things. Don't get too wrapped up in. Uh, I would imagine I've never been in any situation. I won't even attempt to act like I have been, but what you've been in. But I thought the harmonica was was brilliant because it gets your mind off things. Because the mm. worst thing I could imagine in a survival situation is freaking out. That is the worst thing. You know, I mean, so technically speaking in survival, you know, what's the first thing you do? You calm down. That's the first thing you do. Yeah. And then what are you going to do? You build a shelter, you build a fire? No. The next thing you need to do is assess the situation. You've got to take a knee, as they say, and consider all of the options and know what you've got on your body, know what you've got close by, know what you've got further afield. Now make a decision. Do I need a fire? Do I need a shelter? 
you know, that, that sort of thing. And when we return, we'll be talking to uh, Les about what he thinks Sasquatch is, and he's going to start getting into his own personal encounters. You'll definitely want to stay tuned for that. Before we get to that, I want to thank a couple sponsors. I want to thank Robinhood. Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. They strive to make the financial services work for everyone. You know, I signed up uh, with Robinhood and I used the the link sasquatch.robinhood.com and I got a free stock. I got AK Steel. It was actually a really good, cool stock. Uh, it's actually a very good stock. And uh, But they give you three hidden options and you pick one and then you scratch it off and you find out what your, it, it becomes part of your portfolio. Robinhood has easy to understand charts and market data. Place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. With Robinhood, you learn how to invest as you build your portfolio, discover new stocks, and track your favorite companies with personalized news feeds. It's actually a really cool app. If you're looking to get into the stock market and you're intimidated, you're not really sure, you know, like me, you don't really know the stock market that well, uh, Robinhood definitely helps out. You can customize your notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. And I mentioned that AK Steel stock I got that's now in my portfolio. Robinhood is giving listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at sasquatch.robinhood.com. That's sasquatch.robinhood.com. And I want to thank Robinhood again for sponsoring the show. You know, with Christmas coming up, I don't know if you guys have that one person in your life it's hard to find a gift for. Uh, If you get a chance, check out Empty Faces. If you love horror and scary movies, you can bring the mystery of the paranormal home with you. Empty Faces is a monthly subscription where you become immersed in the paranormal investigation. Each month, they will send you cryptic clues, objects, ciphers that you actually use to solve the mystery in real time. And it's pretty cool. They send you a box. There's a lot of it's high quality stuff in the box and you use the different objects to actually solve the the mystery. Empty Faces is perfect to play solo, as a date night, or a game night with friends, especially if you get spooked. You can even join their online community and swap theories with people who are at the same spot as you are. And I know I signed up um, myself and uh, a few friends and one of my friend's daughters as a gift, and she loves it. Uh, My good friend's daughter is always solving the mystery, solving the game before I can. So she's a little bit of a spoiler, Uh, but it's a lot of fun, especially in a group of friends. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to EmptyFaces.com slash Sasquatch for 10% off your first box. They only accept 200 members per day, so hurry up and take advantage of this offer. That's EmptyFaces.com slash Sasquatch for 10% off your first box. EmptyFaces.com slash Sasquatch. And I want to thank Empty Faces for sponsoring the show. Now let's get back to Les Stroud. What got you into Bigfoot? Well, probably the phenomenon itself, if, I, yeah. if I'm being honest. Um, l- looking back, I can remember certain things when I was younger, you know, including, you know, some that confused me and some where I went, oh my gosh. You know, like I, what? I, Give I me think, an example. Well, I certainly I heard the screams in the bush that we've that that and any Sasquatch enthusiast has heard about. You know, they sound like women screaming, like they're being tortured. So I've heard that, but that you know I will say could also be porcupines fighting. It could be mountain lions crying and mating. It could be a number of things. But I heard that, and I remember it sent. It's the only thing that's ever sent me out of the forest was the night that I heard those screams. That was one situation, and it was a survival situation. I was practicing survival with a buddy, but. Um, I would suggest the first reel where I was like, ah, was uh, my then wife and I, we, we, you know my film Snowshoes in Solitude. I spent a year living in the bush with my wife and uh, my then wife. And during that year, we were camped out by the river at one point and we heard bipedal walking coming straight for uh, the tent and they were walking and it was very clearly not a bear, not a moose, not an elk. I know the sounds. This was, this was two heavy footsteps. We were way Northern Canada in the middle of nowhere. And there's just, you know, <laughs> you know, walking. Yeah. And, uh, and I yelled out, Hey, just like I would with a bear, you know, yeah. I, was like, I yelled out right over here. And it literally just, 
stopped. And you sort of hear it slightly turn and then just, and it walked away. So, oh, that could have been anything, Strout. I was in the middle of nowhere. I know the sounds of my ungulates and my four-footed friends and all of that. And even though bear can, they walk in their own paths. So there's that. To this day, I will regret not sticking my head out of the tent, but whatever it was put such a fear in me that I didn't put my head out of the tent. Now, I never feel that when I'm around bears yeah. or, or moose or lions. You know, I don't have that gripping fear, but this, some, something was in the air. Hair was up on the back. So that was, a fir- that was, two th- that was 1994. And then there was the Alaskan episode during Survivor Man. That kind when you of, heard the uh, the big huge, you know that yeah. that big huge sort of you know sounded like a silverback gorilla, but we were in Alaska. Um, and then the freight train sort of sound as it crashed off through the forest. What happened was um, that hap- You know when that happened on that Alaskan episode, I remember thinking, I'm not telling anybody, no way, because I'm here to be Survivor Man. And I was into Survivor Man big time. I was not that I ever stopped being, but I was peaking, you know. Yeah. And I thought, if I tell this story in this episode, that's all anybody's going to ask about. And I don't. I didn't. I was calculated. I didn't want that yet. So I just let it be. And then four years later or something, I was on uh, the Opie and Anthony show in New York City, and I'd never been. Somebody goes, "Hey, did you ever see Bigfoot?" And I knew they were joking, but me being me, I can't answer a joke. I can't slough off a joke question like ah oh, yeah oh yeah lots of I played football with them ha <laughs> and then it's over I'm like well actually <laughs> yeah. and then I tell this story of being up in Alaska and the whole thing well I didn't know that was going to set off a little mini firestorm and uh, that that got me thinking about it anyway and then um, what happened was and I was was talking earlier you know I like to be at the at the zeitgeist of everything you know. I was not at the zeitgeist of, of Sasquatch and Bigfoot, you know, on TV. Finding Bigfoot was. But uh, Doug Highcheck did some great stuff with um, Monsters, something Monsters. Monster Quest. Monster yeah. Quest. I thought that was great. Yeah. You know, that was a great uh, uh, series, um, documentive. But two things. One, I thought, but it's a modern day. There's way better equipment now, and we can tackle this story even better. In fact, I talked and hung out with Doug, and he's a great guy and great stories, and we talked about working together. I thought, let's, let's do you know part two, but upgraded sort of thing. At The other thing that happened at the same time was finding Bigfoot hit. All due respect to those boys. I know they really are into the subject. Cliff is a good – I like Cliff. Nice guy. Yeah. You know, he's the only guy I've met. Um, nice guy. I know they're, they're, they're really into it for real, but they weren't in charge of the show. The producers were. And, right. they, and, and I'll say this. I've said it before. As far as I'm concerned, finding Bigfoot was the worst thing that could have happened for interest in the phenomenon, bar none, because it turned the phenomenon, that's what I like to call it, into a cultural punchline. After that show, everything about Bigfoot was a punchline. Hell, it showed up in a Robert Downey Jr. movie trailer. You know, he plays a lawyer and he goes, and my content or my, my client wants to see Sasquatch. You know, this became a punchline. Yeah. And I remember seeing that and I thought, that's it. That's heartbreaking. So, but right at that time, I thought, okay, no, 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 no. That was my, my reaction. To, uh, doing Survivor Man Bigfoot was a reaction, direct reaction to the miss that I thought, not, notwithstanding their ratings, the miss that I thought Finding Bigfoot was. It was such a cool show, too. The town halls? No, no, no. I'm know? talking about the Survivor Man, the Bigfoot oh, thing that you and did. I would, uh, Why did you stop doing it? It was such a cool show. I liked well, it. Great way to circle back to what we originally talked about. Remember what I said in this industry, it comes down to one person. The network loved it. The ratings were great. My individual executive producer loved it. And then a new gatekeeper took over that position. And she didn't like what she called paranormal. The first thing she said to me, we're not doing any more Bigfoot less. We're not doing any more paranormal. That was it. Wow. Done. Gatekeeper, folks. It's always a gatekeeper. And she's gone. And then when she was gone, the new guy came in and said, hey, how come you're not doing Bigfoot still? And I'm like, well, I would have loved to have done more Bigfoot. You want to yeah. do some more? And then, and then they, you know, by then time had passed. Finding Bigfoot's ratings were starting to fall. And so now the, the new guy comes in, the new gatekeeper, loved it, wondered why I'm not doing it. But the climate was different. And so there it sits. So those 10 episodes, I'm very proud of them. They but, were awesome. But I'm not I done. I definitely am not done. Yeah. I, I do not feel like I finished 
my my uh, cinematic research into the phenomenon. But yeah. what do you think Sasquatch is, Les? And obviously, mm. there's no wrong answer because you don't have one in your garage here, and I don't have one in my garage. So, <laughs> how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Well, I like, as I say, I like to call it a phenomenon um, because I find it fascinating, and because the naysayers have no answer, and the believers have no answer. Right. Um, one of the things I said in the show was that I, I learned very quickly that the community, as is, you know, the Bigfoot community, it gets called, is a wide spectrum of philosophies and perspectives on, on what it is. You know, over here is it is you know, say John Bitternagel, and it's and and all due respect to 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 John, we've lost John, but but um, is is a uh, simply an upright walking ape with a lot of intelligence. Over here, it's aliens. And, and everything in between kind of, you know, uh, meshes and dovetails. So one day I, I really was trying to take it to task mentally, you know. Um, and I – in this is the cool thing. In filming Survivor Man, Bigfoot, the example I gave you about my time in Alaska, well, times that by 10 now of experiences. All sorts of crazy things were, were going on. You know, the night on the top of the mountain and, and uh, went out with the – <laughs> the controversial figure Todd Standing, oh, all yeah. that stuff. Lots of stuff went on. So I started changing my own tune, you know, I, I, uh, and what I decided to do was say, okay, and I, you've asked a crazy question, so it's a long way around no. answering you, but this is, you can't answer it shortly. A tangent. I'm at a party. Dude, so do you believe in Bigfoot or what? Conversation's over. Right. Not going to answer that question. I'm at a party. Listen, what, like, what do you – tell me what about – like, what is it about that thing? Like, what do you think it is? Okay, now we have a conversation. Right. Let's crack a Guinness and sit down and talk, yeah. you know. Um, so I started to look at the attributes of this phenomenon. What are the attributes? Well, it's a collection of attributes that are eyewitness stories and telling, you know. And what are they? Well, man, they are, they are so uh, numerous – you know, and so what are the ones that are, carry the most weight? What are the ones that can keep repeating themselves over and over again? Let's look at those. And what am I hearing now? <laughs> A cricket now? It's Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're stressing too much. It's sound guy. <laughs> uh, um, I am hearing something, though. Yeah, I think it's a um... – An anomaly? <laughs> See, it's it's a government. That's what's happening. There it is. <laughs> uh, this, we're going to turn this into a conspiracy show for sure. Um there's so many incredible attributes to this phenomenon. And then I started thinking, well, wait a minute. What if we do, as Joe Rogan would say, Occam's razor? What if instead of Occam's razor, we use what uh, someone taught me was the alternate of that, which is Hickam's dictum, which is instead of it being it has to be this thing, why can't it be all of these things? You're trying to figure out a disease. Oh, it's this because of that. Well, actually – but it also could be this or this, right. you know, and maybe it is all three, you know. So then I looked at Bigfoot in the same light, you know. Well, why can't he have this skill or that skill set or this attribute or that physical attribute? And I'm very open-minded. Um, we'll put the alien connection on the shelf for now because that feels like something – that's a whole conversation in itself. So let's put that over there on the shelf. So – Notwithstanding yeah. the alien connection thoughts, you still have a plethora of attributes that are unique and powerful and many of which you can attribute maybe one at a time to actual physical creatures that exist on the planet, whether it be cloaking you know, or infrasound. These things the scientists side like to say, oh, infrasound, yeah, lions can do that to gazelles. That makes – then there's the other side of things like – psychic ability and stuff like right. that or mind speak as it gets called well what about scientific research into that sort of thing oh it turns out there's been you know this and that and they you know certain humans show this and okay so let's take all of those and put them together i'll tell you one of the more fascinating things that i think and and i love the guy is is a cool guy he's a nice guy um i i Chris, I think you're great, but you could use some polish on how you present your theory because I think his theory is pretty has got some merit. And what if we took all these attributes and we placed them on a species that also was severely autistic? And you think about, you know, autism in the world. 
what autism, autis- a severely autistic person can do is mind boggling. Like, okay, how, how did the human camera look at the skyline of New York City for three seconds, turn around and re and, and put it, draw it yep. to the, the street light, you know, right? That's just got to be impossible. Well, not in that man's mind. How does this boy who's eight years old and his, his autistic gift is hiding in a room and you can't find him? That's weird, you know, but powerful. And, and Chris's thought is what if the species is inherently severely autistic, but with, we'll call them powers, right? We'll call them um, Chris, superpowers. Christopher Noel. Chris I Noel, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I should have said, yeah, Christopher Noel. Um, I, I think there's merit in that. So if we take all of these and put them all together, we have what I like to call the phenomenon. And that's what I find the most fascinating. So I don't sit in the camp where it's a big old ape. And I don't sit in the camp where it's descended from aliens. I sit in the camp where I think something's out there. Something's going on. I will say that. I'll go down that limb. But what it can do and what it is, I don't know. But that, I've never, I didn't even answer your question with a definitive, but that is the question. I don't question, is it? I question, what is it? That's, right. You know. Exactly. And that's the thing. No one really knows. I mean, people who say it's an ape, they don't know. People who say it's Neanderthal, they don't know. It's like uh, when I ask that question, sometimes people come back and say, well, it's an alien. You could be right. I, you know, you, it could exactly. be 100% Might right. Be, it could be all of the above. It could be all of the above. And Absolutely. The, the fear on the, on, the, uh, on the ape side of it is, the, is, is honestly is the fear of acceptance from their peers, scientific peers. There a lot, you know, um, Jeff Meldrum, brilliant, love the man. I would love to – he doesn't he, – he, uh, he's a wonderful, gentle human being and he doesn't partake of alcohol in any way. I'd love to slip him a, a couple of beer one night and go, come on, come on. Tell me what you really think, Jeff. Because yeah. I have a feeling – and I know Jeff will hear this and I love the guy, but I have a feeling that in his heart of hearts, there's pieces of him that are like – yeah, I don't think it's just an ape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you I, know, I think there's, yeah. there's more. You know, even John Bennernagel said that to me. He goes, "I don't. I used to that think it was an ape." Surprises me. It was right before he died, and I was asking him about well, him, and I talked all the time. And I asked him, I said, "What? What do you? Th- what do you really think it is, John?" And he goes, "You know what? So I used to say it was an ape. I, I don't, I don't think it's an ape." I, I'm happy to hear that because he and I actually got in a little bit of an argument. On it, and I, and I just, I just knew, and that's part of where I'm getting this is John was very. It's, we've got to get these other scientists to accept, and I was like, why, why? Do you think you know? I'm watching a wonderful series on Na- National Geographic right now called Genius, and and they, so far they've done Picasso and Einstein. Those two didn't care who yeah. accepted their crazy theories. They just they just went for it. And I wanted John and Jeff, you know, to kind of go the same way. Jeff is an incredible scientist with incredible research. But I want him to go, come on, man, let's 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 entertain the concept of a telepathic kind of thing. Just let's just do that. For sake of the argument, you know. Yeah. That's where I'm at. And I'm at that because I experienced it. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So I mean Tell so, me about that. Well wow. Uh, I don't know about, if you want to, if you don't I don't want mind. To, okay. I don't mind at all. I mean, I don't. You know, like I, I'm always just me. I don't really care. You know, I, I've yeah. taken enough slagging over the years. It. Well, you know, I've had a lot of. I don't mean to cut you off your story, but I've, I've had a. The show is mainly witness encounters. People come on and mm. share their encounters, mm. and the more people share, the more you can start putting pieces of the puzzle together. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, you didn't answer the question on what you think Sasquatch is because you don't know. Mm. No one knows. Mm-hmm. Despite what everyone says, no one knows. And actually, anybody who does know, that's not the person I want to hear from. Exactly. You've got to be more open-minded than that. Well, if we're going to go experiences, I mean, I mean certainly, and there was more than, than just just what happened during the filming of, of Survivor Man Bigfoot. Um, the, I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll tell it from that one, though, that perspective, because that was the most dramatic. It, it's been more than once now, but really? very rare, just the same. And so... I don't consider myself to have any anything psychically right, or anything right. like that. I was filming the Smoky Mountain, Tennessee episode, and I was with uh, Scott Carpenter, really, real nice guy, cool guy. Um, love is, is is interest in the phenomenon, and he's he also floats around what it could be and what it might not be, and it's uh, so he took me out to his hotspot, as we call him, and uh, everything was cool. I went out and I said, okay, here's what I want to do. And you can watch it on the show. You can see it on the episode. Um, just uh, leave me out here and you leave 
and I'm going to stay out here until it gets dark. And everyone knows that's the creepiest time to be out in the no. bushes as it gets dark. Middle of the night's not that big of a deal with a flashlight, but for some reason, as it's getting dusky and into dark, and of course, it was a stormy night, so the wind is blowing and all that. And I sat out there alone in the middle of this spot, which was his favorite place and where he has most of his encounters, so to speak. And I thought, eh, you know, well, I'm going to walk back. And I said, I'm going to walk back in the dark now. And I was literally like tempting fate, trying to tempt fate. So if you watch the show, you see me say, you know what? The hair just went up on the back of my neck. Let's just see what happens. So I'm like taunting the situation. Ah, I'll show you guys. Let's just see what happens. So I'm, you know, filming myself as Survivor Man does. And, and, uh, and we, I think we cut to commercial, come back, and, and we just moved on because eh, nothing much happened. It's not the truth. Um, because what happened, I wasn't ready to share. Not a chance. Uh, not that early in making the show. And, and why not? Because the gatekeepers wouldn't have been able to handle it. They would have said, no, Les, you can't. Whoa, whoa. Hey, whoa, TMI. No, no, no. Well, what happened was the hair went up on the back of my neck and I was gripped with this whole sort of thing. And again, I'm, you know, heck, I jogged 200 yards from where we're sitting right now and did not have that feeling and was stalked by a mountain lion the whole time. And we ended up butting, you know, we were 15 feet across from each other looking at each other. And But I, I still, I just, I understand wildlife well, yeah. that I don't usually get that fear factor. I'm like, okay. I'm 175 pounds, cat. You better make this a good jump if you because you're not as big as me, and I'm not a 12 year old. I'm not an eight year old kid. And the cat, and I'm, and they, I just yell at the cat. He takes off. So that's all to explain the fact that with wildlife, I'm not instantly gripped with hair on the back of my neck, sort of instinctual stuff because I'm I've trained so much with wildlife right. that I just know what to do. It's a different approach. But there I am, stormy night, middle of the bush. Tennessee, Smoky Mountains, and all my instinct and, you know, Neanderthal man instincts are on high alert. And so I stopped. And then it hit. And I've never experienced this. I'd never experienced this before in my life. And uh, this is, and I've heard other people describe this. It was like it was right in the middle of my head, right inside my brain. The strongest ever uh, voice that was not my own and just said, if you want to meet us, stay the night. Creepy. And I just stood there gripped in fear. I, I was like, uh, 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 I was like, you know, just like stammering. And then the second line was, and, and the funny thing is, before the second line was in my head, I felt this already. I felt like there was something standing right over there on that hill. So there's a gully and then a hill. And it felt, that's all I can tell you. Feelings aren't facts, yeah, but I, I felt like it was a big prime of his life sort of male and a smaller young one. And, and the second voice said, the second time it said, you know, we're over here on the hill, but you have to stay. And I literally, this is Survivor Man talking now, I literally in my head I, at some point I thought I, I got to an answer. And in, I just, in my voice, just thought, I'm not ready for this. I can't. And it was literally, okay. And then turned and walked away. It turned and walked away. The feeling went away. The hairs went down on the back of my neck. It was gone. It was over. And it was so weird. I went and actually talked to a counselor and said, listen, what's schizophrenia? Because, you know, and of course, which yeah. she said, first of all, if you had schizophrenia, you wouldn't be asking me if you had schizophrenia. And so it was the weirdest thing ever. Now I've experienced that about three other times. And as you can tell now, I take it kind of casually because to me, I thought, well, it's just telepathy. A lot of people talk about scientists study telepathy. Maybe, maybe that's an attribute because they don't have our larynx and our vocal cords and all that, although they make noises and all the rest, maybe that's their language. That, that maybe they're born with the, the a strong. I mean, what if we were all born with the ability to, to to use telepathic communication? We wouldn't be talking like this right now. We'd be thinking it. So no. maybe that's them. I don't know. I'm making that up as I go along because that's what I just try to make re sense reason out, make yeah. sense of it. Yeah. But that's what I felt. You know, call it mind speak, call it whatever you want. All I'm saying is that's what I experienced. I share that with very few people, except now your millions of listeners. And uh, we'll keep <laughs> no, that I'm between glad, ourselves, no, folks. No, I'm glad you did. I mean, yeah. I, I even recently had a um, state trooper tell me a very similar story. 
um, of it. He was out hunting, actually, and he had the, he never saw the creatures. But what was fascinating is he was telling me about this mind speak about something talking to him. Mm -hmm. And that worries me a little bit. I don't know if it's like religious background, but that kind of worries me a little bit. And you really stopped and think if that's what these things are, like, look, I understand what you're saying about telepathy, but what is this thing? Like, what the hell is this thing? Well, really? again, forget forget the uh, – keeping religiosity out of it. It's just a thing. I mean, a lion, a tiger, a Sasquatch. Um, a small example. Up in northern Saskatchewan, they have um, seven teachings, and the seven teachings are based on you know, truth, honesty, you know, whatever, strength. And so you've got, you know, the beaver represents this and the wolf represents that. And uh, as a matter of fact, honesty is represented by Sabe, Sasquatch. And it goes on to the eagle and – We'll step back for a second and look. It's seven creatures. None of them are mythological. It's not the Thunderbird, right, you know, right. or the ghost thing. Right. It's beaver, fox, wolf, Sasquatch, eagle, you know. And so demystify it. You know, demystify. This could be an attribute and nothing more. I've taken it so casually. I mean, one time literally – I swear I was going – it was Grizzly Peak in southern Oregon and I, and I – and so now I do this. I'll go out and lots of times and, I, you know, I don't even – I won't tell who I'm with. Or, you know, I'll just – but in my mind, I'll just put it out there. Hiking through your hills today if you're, if you're around, you know, uh, be, cool, be interested in meeting. I do that all the time. Nothing ever happens. Yeah. One time I did. Really? Oh, that one time. Yeah. No, no. One, another time it did. I got – this is what I got back. We're sleeping. That's what really? I got back. Like it was just like a hammer to my head. Boom, we're sleeping. Do you wish you could have gone back and stayed the night that night? Looking yeah, back now, of course I do. Yeah, of course I do. But um, I wasn't ready. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know about the tele telepathy thing. I didn't know any mind speak. That, that was all. And and here's the thing. Here's this. Here's a wonderful. And I'd love for your listeners to to realize this. This is something I've I've since discovered. So we have all these eyewitness stories and audible stories and experiential stories. All right. So I got a friend close by here, actually, and there's someone that he respects highly and knows her really well and uh, lived with her and, 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 and she rented off her sort of thing. And she told him that she saw Sasquatch twice. All right. And he, highly respected person. So think conservation officer, your uncle, police All officer, right. friend, teacher, whomever. Then he always finishes it with, ah, but yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, really, I'm, I don't know. And this is where I move in. This is where I like to 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 just bring the hammer down. Whoa, 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 whoa! Hang on a second. So you don't you don't you don't think it's you probably don't think it's possible. Well, I don't I don't really think so. I don't know you know. But she says I said okay, let's call her right now right now and call her. A freaking liar. You said you respected and trusted her. Now you're saying she's full of it. Let's call her up right now and call her a liar. Well, no, I mean, yeah. exactly. So I did a thing once at, at a, a, a convention. I, had every, I said, everybody stand up who's had a Bigfoot experience. And about 30 people stood up. Everybody sit down if it wasn't visual. A bunch of people sat down. Everybody, you know, so I was left with about everybody sit down who thinks – who knows that it wasn't a mistake. Some people sat down. I was left with about a half a dozen people. I said, now, I want all the rest of you in this audience to look at these people. Let's call them liars. Oh, you don't want to call them a liar. Well, then they saw what they saw. You know what I'm saying? And never mind. So the thing is, the question is this. You're only left with a certain couple of options. Number one, they're lying. Number two, it's a case of mistaken identity. Number three, they're delusional. Now, the delusional thing is a cop-out for everybody who doesn't want to be interested in the subject matter. Ah, you're all delusional. It's a mass hallucination. Right. Well, you got to put that one on the table somewhere because there's no answer for that. People are just, no, you're delusional. Well, let's just throw it out of the equation for the sake of argument that these people are not delusional. So we're left with lying, mistaken identity, or they're giving you a factual representation of what they saw. And if we have hundreds of these, which we do, in fact, we have thousands, combined with the aboriginal stories over, you know, hundreds of, 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 of societies who have a regular, you know, yeah, they're there, combined with all these attributes, what are you left with? The very real possibility that the phenomenon exists, whatever it is. 
But that's my thing is I defy you to stand and look at your uncle, the conservation officer, and say, hey, Uncle Joe, I was thinking about what you said. You're a liar, right? But no, Never we don't do that but because you go, wait a minute. But yet we walk away from them and their crazy story kind of thinking that. So I like to challenge that. And because these are, we're not talking about the wackos that tell their stories. We're talking no, about real people. Yeah, I would say I, I very rarely get any wackos. And, you know, I'm talking people from all walks of life. Mm-hmm. Cops. Why, why is a cop's good word? Why is his word so good in any other situation? But not here. Not here. Conservation officer yeah. who's a professional, right. you, know, you know, sort of thing. Uh, media, of course, likes to, you know, get some toothless wonder who, who you know, yeah. backwoods person. Ah, oh, well, my grandmother feeds them pies. You know, that's yeah. they do that. And it's so unfortunate. It is. And, and that's the thing, I think, with with my show is when <laughs> I've had skeptics tell me that I don't believe in Bigfoot. But that per- that guy saw something. Mm-hmm. I listened to him break down in tears, telling you what he saw. That guy saw something. Yeah. And so I think that's really how you have to approach it a lot of times with skeptics is you can't cram it down people's throats. It's <laughs> like I used to tell John the same thing with the scientific community. The point I was trying to make is to some of these people, I'll say um, the scientific community is not interested anyway. So what do you care? It's like what you were talking about with the eight people that believe it's an ape. And if you talk about anything strange, well, we can't do that because the scientific community will think we're nuts. They already think you're nuts. You're chasing unicorns in their mind. Mm -hmm. So who cares? Mm -hmm. Start looking into it. You know what I mean? There might be something to it. Yep. Like you talked about with with telepathy. And I appreciate you sharing that. That Well, I mean, and like I said, going back to uh, the problem with series like – Finding Bigfoot and a couple of the other ones that spinned off off of that, you know, whatever monster this or swamp that or whatever, no. is they just made it a joke. And and that makes pe- – that now everybody's giggling and, and people get uncomfortable. I've got family members. I wouldn't dream of talking about this. And they, I remember my niece asked me one time, like, you know, and even just asking the question, she couldn't ask it without giggling. I thought, this conversation's over. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, like we're talking about something real. And, and so when people are listening to something like this, and they, here's one I love. I'm out hunting every year of my life for 45 years. I've never seen a thing. It's all nonsense. Like, okay, let's, let's just dissect that for a second. How often do you hunt? Oh, two, two solid weeks. So two weeks out of 52 in a year. You go where? Oh, you go to this one, this place, and you hunt. And because you've never seen anything, they don't yeah. exist. Like that. It's just the rationale is is haywire. A lot yeah. of times with with people who they're skeptical and they don't even know why they're skeptical. But as I say, a lot of the modern media in the last eight years did much to ruin ruin that. You know, yeah. by making it funny. You know, what, what's your take on you know when let's say when a cougar is around or a bear is around. You don't quite get that hair standing up on your neck. However, when these things are around or when you've been in those situations, it's almost like your body kicks in and it's Mm -hmm. alerting you. Something's not right. What's what's your take on that? I think that that would speak to the essence of whatever um, a Sasquatch is. It's got to be something powerful, you know, Um, and – We've seen, we've been, I've been watching bears since I could watch television when I was a kid on TV, at least, you know? And so I think that, again, whatever it is they are, I'm not giving them superhuman status. I'm just saying they have attributes that are powerful. We don't quite understand. We don't quite understand, or at least powerful. You know, even if we can compartmentalize the infrasound and the cloaking ability and the telepathy and the strength and all that, if we can compartmentalize all of it, it still kind of comes off as as, a, as an avenger. Yeah. You know, we're talking we're talking something powerful. Um, and so, why why wouldn't I get you know the creeps uh, if if I'm around? I, I I remember in Bend, Oregon. Um, I, I had no reason. I mean, I'm a I'm a healthy dude, and I had no reason. But I just had this overwhelming feeling that there were quite a few uh, around where I was. And all of a sudden, for no reason, inexplicably, I was nauseous. I I turned white and almost fainted. And no reason whatsoever. Oh, well, it's what you ate that day. Could have been. Could have been. But I ate like I did every day. And I was healthy. I was out on a hiking trail. Oh, you exerted yourself. Could have. You're like I'm but, Survivor you know, Man, baby. Yeah, it's like, but you know, but I know I'm self-aware. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and that was so. That leads me to an interesting thing. Here's a phenomenon that 
those who research the phenomenon will recognize. And I don't think it's, I'm certain it's not a matter of the mind. The more you research, never mind the logistical sense of this, the more things do seem to start to happen. And the more you notice. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's just a learned response. You're, you're picking up on things. Well, I'm sure that is part of it. But I also think there's a relationship. There's a connection thing that happens. Um, kind of like when you stare into the abyss, it stares back at you type thing. No, yeah. no. More relational. More like they've recognized where you're at as a human being and where they're at as a species, whatever they are. They've recognized that you've recognized that you're not a threat, that you're just interested, you know. So let's fast forward to last year and outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, and I, wanting to do another Survivor Man Bigfoot, did so for my online SurvivormanTV.com. So this time it's all on my paycheck. It's all on my money. I'm going to go and do this myself. And I thought, good, I'm gonna, I want to I wanna push the envelope a little more now about this whole telepathy thing and all this other worldly stuff. So we went up and I went up with a good friend who's had some crazy experiences and I met with a woman who, you know, has what she considers to be a relationship with them and we'll just notwithstanding all the arguments that get that against that, we'll let it go. Just fast forward to me in the middle of the bush in the middle of the night and in a zone where these, this species, this phenomenon, according to this lady, this was their area. It was pretty wild and, and, and there's there, there there there's a communication there, right? And I'd felt it from them before, just just that mind speak thing. This was right. one of those times, and it's kind of like they know you're coming, right? So I went in, I went out in the bush with my friend Devin, and uh, we sat up all night with a little fire. And I remember trying to do the mind speak thing, and you know, and. Uh, and then all of a sudden, finally, uh, it just hit. And, and we weren't smoking nothing. We weren't drinking nothing. Yeah. We were just out there. And uh, and it just hit like, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it was almost like he was saying, my friends are there kind of now, but I'll be coming later. And I, and I literally had a discussion and said, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be asleep. Like, I'm going to fall asleep here. And the answer was, I'll wake you up. Hmm. All right. So. Fast forward to a few hours later and uh, – or no, sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll not finish this moment. An hour later or so, um, where it's dark and, and uh, Devin says, come here. Come here and look at this. And I walked over. He didn't have to point it out. He didn't have to tell me what he saw. He didn't have to say anything. I just walked – I saw it as I was walking over. And as sure as I'm sitting here, first time in my life, never seen it since, I'm looking at – Two hovering lights, 15 feet away in the really? bush. Yeah, there they are. What do we, well, I guess, what do they call them? Orbs? Yeah. There it is, right there. I'm sober. I'm not tired yet. I'm not, hadn't been sleeping. And we're just, there we are. I'm like, okay, you know? And Devin had experienced this before. He's communicating, and you could see one was the size of, um, let's call it uh, smaller than a CD, the uh, golf ball. The other one was the size of a pie plate, 15 feet away, just hovering. There was no refraction, no lights from cars or houses. Nothing was bouncing off of a roof. Nothing like that at all. This This was a half an hour. For a half an hour, they stayed there. And they seemed to move a little bit, you know. And I remembered, he said, you know, my my friends or whatever are there, you know. I can't remember exactly what he he said, you know, yeah. he being supposedly the Sasquatch. So we go to well, whatever. We go to sleep. We sit down, that that just it just fades and and dissolves, if you will, into thin air. And we sit we sit down. We now we sleep. So we're sleeping, curl up on the ground and and uh I think so I remember when he said I'll come in and wake you up, he said, I think he said I'll, no, no, no. Now I got my memory correct. I'll wake up. Okay, so now I'm asleep. I wake up so quickly that I jump to my feet. Have you ever woken up and jumped to your feet? That's a rare occasion. We do that maybe twice in our life. Right, right. For some weird reason that you could, that you would ever wake up and jump to your feet at the same time. So I'm sleeping in the kind of the fetal position on the ground, a little crackling fire there. What happened was something came along and 
spun my body over as I slept, like physically flipped my body over. It felt like warm fur touching my calf that did this. I jumped up and told my friend Devin, kind of said, but I didn't see anything. Next day, we're walking out, and the woman who sort of hosted the area and said, you know, so how, how did it go? And she supposedly has a connection. She says, well, she, she, uh, I, she calls him Guardian, you know. She said, well, I spoke with Guardian last night. He said he was going to go to you in the middle of the night and that he touched you. You know, so That's crazy uh, coincidence. Sure. Possibly could be. It's a strange but coincidence. I, well, you know, like I said, I'm I'm in the bush all my life. I'm yeah. sleeping out on rocks by fires all my life. I know what hallucination is. I know what feeling overtired is. I know what it is to – heck, one of the strengths when I do eco-challenge races is that I'm the guy who can last with sleep deprivation better than – you know, I might not have the strongest legs for riding the bike when we're doing that part of the race, but I'm always the guy who's good when we've gone 48 hours without sleep. And I'm out there, and this was just the evening, you know, and that happened, and so – I forget how I got there, but that was recent. Do you think the lights are related? I filmed the lights. I know exactly what you mean. I, I filmed it with the night vision, and it's, it was a ball. Uh, I'll show it to you after the interview if you want to see it. But it was a ball of light, and it was just hovering there. It was the strangest. Um, it was weird, man. I, I don't even know what it was. But do you think they're related, and what color were they? You said blue? Whitish. Whitish, Whitish with it. Well, you could say a blue tinge, actually, uh, now that I'm thinking about it. But you're, you're ta- ta- it's taxing my memory at this point. Um, well, uh, again, fanciful thinking, maybe, I don't know. I really don't have the answer, but I'm wondering if, um, the concept of astral projection has got anything to do with it. The woman seemed to be implying that, that this is their abilities. Well, let's, let's think about that for a second. See, what do I, here's what I think, you know, what do I think they are? Here's, here's what, as far as I like to go. I think they're a species that understands laws of the universe that we don't. Now, Toy with me with that for a little while. Let's pretend or suggest that we, un- we are all vibrating, right? What if we could control that? If we could control our vibrational speed, but we vanish. not. We, exactly. Thank, you, you see where I'm going with this? So what if this is a species that had an ability to manipulate universal laws that we're just scratching, this quantum physics, that we're just scratching the surface of now? You know, it's apropos that I've been watching the, the Genius series on Einstein because, again, he's, you know, he challenged, the uni- or, or he challenged Newton's understanding of the universe and yeah. was right. You know, so, so what if they have this ability like we breathe? What if it's just like, yeah, well, you, just, you just vibrate a little different, you know, and now it's really hard to see me, isn't it? You know, uh, and, and, you know, so that is – and I'm not going to get into, you know, souls and all that sort of stuff. I'm just going to say that maybe it's astral projection. I don't know. I yeah. don't know. But I saw them. This, uh, this yeah, time, I've seen know. them too. I filmed them, so I mean it. It's and haven't and thousands of people have. Yeah, that's what we're not just sitting here as a couple of uh, Bigfoot freaks. No, like, I think people need to realize that these stories, these attributes, these experiences are shared not by a few dozen people, right. not by a few hundred people, by thousands of people over many, many years, maybe as many years. Um, that generally the thing. speaking, they're saying the same thing. Yeah. You can read a report from like 1910 and it sounds like a modern day report. Yeah. Well, and they say, well, that's because it's, you know, it's just projected onto what you're saying now. You know, again, bring the uncle that you respect so highly that's a conservation officer in front of you. Have him sit at the kitchen table and yeah. tell him he's a liar. Yeah. You know, when he's, he's like, I know what I saw. And this is the thing. These are people who have nothing to gain. Right. You know, sometimes to lose. And they say, look, it, I don't care what you think. I know what I saw. I'm a clean, sober individual. I know the woods. That weren't no elk, you know? Yeah. Well, and, you know, you ask most people that drink and smoke weed or whatever, how many times have you seen a large monkey running through the woods? <laughs> you know what I mean? Never. The answer no. is never. That's right. Um, so it's such a ridiculous argument sometimes people use. I want to ask you, though, um, just to kind of wrap things up, have you ever seen any UFOs or what's the, what's some of the weirdest things you've seen out there Beyond Bigfoot, it mm. could be anything. Well, it's a connection, though, um, uh, that I experienced. And this, this uh, again, was a thing I wasn't either ready to or able to because of the gatekeepers share on the Survivor Man Bigfoot episode. And that was when I went up to the top of the mountain with uh, the one Todd, Sta- Todd Standing and his, his research area up there. 
And um, the second night, um, I asked him to leave, and I stayed on the top of that mountain alone. And um, I will – it was weird because this touches on another thing, and, and I'll just brief this, and that is – it's amazing that sometimes we don't utilize our best skills in these moments. It's like, why didn't you just take a picture? Right. <laughs> I didn't even think of it. Right. And that's happened to me a couple of times. So I'm up on the mountain, and I had a weird thing later that night that just freaked me out. But the first thing that happened was it's dark now. And I casually look over to the right, on top of a mountain, and looking down at the most amazing valley, but I can't see a city. Like, I'm not near Jasper, or, you know, Alberta, or anything like that. And I look over, and I, you know, I saw four massive lights. Well, what do you mean, four massive lights? I got to say that if they were airplanes, or if it was an airplane, it would be an airplane the size of a, of, of a shopping mall, because, my goodness, this the lights were huge, and... They looked to be a mile away, and they were just hovering there in the sky, four big, huge, bright, round lights hovering in the sky. And, and I was like, oh, is that just a jet coming in for landing and its weird refraction of the light? And I was like, no, for like 20 minutes, it was up there until at one moment I looked and it was just gone, it just vanished out of the sky. I didn't watch it vanish. In fact, I got bored with it. Why didn't I film it? I don't know why I didn't film it, but it was not in my inclination to film it. And yet I'm standing there staring. And I think, again, kind of like when the Sasquatch thing happened in the Alaska episode, I didn't want to confuse what I was doing with Survivor Man by talking about Bigfoot. Now I'm filming Bigfoot, and I didn't want to confuse what I'm doing with Bigfoot <laughs> to talk about aliens yeah. and spaceships. I'm just like, ah. Oh. I felt like going, not now, guys, <laughs> you know, but I should have paid more attention. Um, and then that was the night. So that happened for about 20 minutes. It disappears. I go back to the fire. I go to sleep. I wake up. And this part will ever, forever freak me out. Was it lucid dreaming? I don't know. But I swear to you, I, as sure as I'm sitting here, I, I had the feeling like something was sitting on top of me. In my, I'm in my sleeping bag with the, the it pulled over my head like a cocoon. So I sleep when I'm, yeah. out, you know, and because uh, I'm bald and so my head gets yeah. cold. So I get I'm, it. Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm doing that and I couldn't move. And um, it wasn't that I couldn't move my left arm that I was sleeping on. I couldn't move my right arm that was free to the top of me. And it, it felt so much like something was sitting on me. And it felt unmenacing. It felt almost like joking, like somebody's going, ha ha, you can't move. I felt two big buttocks, just a big pair of buttocks sitting on me on this. Well, finally, uh, it it just kind of lifts off of me and I'm like scrambling to get my my head down. I I pop out and there's, you know, nothing there. Maybe I was lucid dreaming. Okay, I'll give you that. We put stuff up in the tree. It's 100 feet away. I go down the next morning. Power bars, apples, and long story short, we'd done it the night before. The camera fell over, blah, blah, blah. So th- this time the camera didn't fall over. It had, a, had a, a motion camera. The dust in the air was setting the camera off, so I knew it was sensitive. It was picking up things really quickly. I think it's a three-second delay, that sort of thing. And I show it in the, in the episode, and I wish people would see just how freaky it was. And I'll, I will tell a behind-the-scenes story about, about Todd in this moment, but... I'm looking, everything's gone off. I get up in the morning, everything's missing off the tree. Okay, everything's missing. There's quite a few things. I look, the camera's still in the right position. (gasps) All right, I'm pulling out the SD card going, oh my, what is on you? Yeah. You know, climb down the mountain. I hike down the mountain, finish filming, drop the card, you know, to my editors down and go, okay, Max, show me what's on this. We got to look. And we look. And everything that was on the tree disappears before our eyes, just gone. Wow. One, one second, it's there in the footage. It's there on the tree. Next, it's gone. Just gone. Even a mouse climbing up the tree to dislodge the apple would easily have been seen. Even an owl who came through quickly and grabbed – and remember, this was a number of the power bars and apples that were taken yeah. – would have set off that camera. It just disappeared. I have no explanation for that. So we're looking at this, and Todd's looking at it. 
And this was, again, goes back to that discussion about why guys who are on the ape side of the fence do not want to scare people away with big lofty talk. And he's looking and he goes, oh, 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 no, 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 that, that's like, that's like paranormal. You can't show that. You can't show that. And I said, really? well, it's my show and I'll show whatever yeah. I want. We did show it. Fast forward. Here's a great part of the story. Addendum to the story. Fast forward to three months later in the edit suite. Did you guys get that? You know, what do you, I want to see how we're, we're cutting together that whole thing with the, I want to, cause like, just play it the way it is. Cause wow, it's creepy. And my editor and junior editor goes, yeah. Well, and where, where did you want to put the, that, uh, that head that pops in the screen? I'm like, excuse me. Yeah. At the end of the clip, that, that little head that pops up. Show me. We never saw this. We missed it. We were so excited about the apples disappearing. And he shows me, and that's when you see it in the episode. At the very end, there's this, I can only say it this way, ape-like shaped dome pops up in the bottom of the frame and goes out again. The bottom of the frame is seven feet in the air. It's not a sheep. Maybe a grizzly, but there were no grizzly ears. You know? How do you account for everything van- vanishing, though? And I was 100 feet away. You know what I mean? Yeah. 100 feet away, sleeping. And I'm on the top of a mountain. There's nobody else there. Mr. Yeah. Standing did not climb back up and climb up the tree. And t- I mean, pff, I'm right there. Yeah. You know, it just all happened. Do I have an explanation for this? Nope. And that's why I find it so fascinating. I'm fascinating with the unknown. I don't really, I just came back from Portugal. I, the, the Roman stuff was interesting. The Visig- Visigoths, really interesting stuff. I went to the Portuguese Stonehenge. I want to know about stuff that happened 38,000 years ago that yeah. nobody knows what it Me is. Me too. Uh, you know, Machu Picchu and, and, and uh, of Crocus course, uh, stoles and, Susc- yes, yeah. I want to know yeah. about that stuff. I want to know about the stuff you can't explain. Right. You know, that's what, and, and right now, this phenomenon can't be explained, so it's still fascinating to me. When it becomes... A thing, you know what's going to happen? If it ever comes out and it's like, yeah, they exist, it's going to be de facto for everybody else. Be like, oh, yeah, we figured. No, you didn't. Yeah. No, you didn't. You know, uh, and, and that's what's going to happen. All the skeptics will scatter like cockroaches when that comes out. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. we figured, you know, that it was. And yeah. so, uh, you know, and then that, there's a whole other angle down of as to why why isn't it uh, public knowledge? And if, if, if um, other, you know organizations or the government know why isn't it public knowledge it's a whole other yeah that's a whole other topic yeah yeah i <laughs> yeah, know you're right for another time folks <laughs> well the uh i appreciate you having me Les mayor i'm very gracious of you thank you very much that's my pleasure um and where can people get your music i know we were talking about that before we went on the air mm-hmm. uh, where can you get some you did some cool music man well I'm, i've got my fifth cd out now it's called bitter and lake um i've got three albums i'm i'm uh one that is ready called Mother Earth and another one we're working on. All three uh, produced by Mike Klink, who's famous for Guns N' Roses. He created their sound. Uh, Metallica, Aerosmith, all sorts of people. And uh, four independent CDs before these ones that I've done as well. So my music's been going for a long time. I'm performing. I'm about to go up and do a, Nor- a New England tour. So I'm um, touring the city wineries in Boston and New oh, York cool. and, and Washington and some places in southern Ontario, Canada. Um, Lestroud.ca. LesStroud.ca is my website, and and everything is there for my music. Of course, Spotify and iTunes is usual the usual suspects for that. Um, and the music that I do is you know run the gamut from blues and folk to now it's getting you know now I'm able to put out a little bit more rock. Next album is a full rock album. Uh, and uh, the cool thing is a lot of the stuff I'm doing lately is all about celebrating nature and 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 it's very apropos that I sing to that, that I lyricize, you know, I, I write lyrics to that. Yeah. Um, it works for who I am and what I do, but I'm a hell of a great performance. I love the stage, you know, and, and, uh, I, I don't mind saying it that way because I try to get people to come out to realize you're going to have a great evening. And you know, what's cool because of the survivor man stuff, I learned not to shy away from survivor man. Yeah. And I learned to simply, uh, Accept it so that when I do a concert, I'll break in the middle and do a Q and A on Survivor Man, and we'll talk oh, for Survivor Man cool. about twenty minutes or Bigfoot. That's really cool. Uh, be, then it's a very intimate evening, and then it's yeah. like, you guys want to play another song? Yeah, <laughs> and I start rocking out. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Lesstroud.ca. Les, thanks for coming on, man. My pleasure. Thank fun. you. Thanks, man. And that wraps up episode five hundred. I want to thank Les Stroud for coming on and being so open to share. 
I want to thank Tony Merkel from the Confessionals podcast. And thank you guys for coming on and just taking the time to listen to the show. I really do appreciate it. Hopefully we can get another 500 under our belt. Um, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. I'll be back on Sunday for the members. For everyone else, I will see you guys next time.